Coming up this week, Claude Code comes to Slack, Perplexity reveals how we're really using AI agents, and a series of new announcements from Google, including a new prototyping tool and a feature that could transform how we do code reviews. Stay tuned for all of that and more, and if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. So first up this week, Slack seems to be cementing its place firmly at the centre of AI task delegation. This week, Anthropic revealed a new beta feature for Slack, which allows engineers and other product team members to delegate tasks to Claude Code. One example they featured in their demo video accompanying the launch is a scenario where a bug is reported by a client in production. And so to fix this, a member of the company's product team channel can ping Claude Code to identify the problem and implement a fix. Anthropic says that the context of Slack discussions can be used to reproduce and fix bugs, and it calls this collaborative debugging. The release also reflects a broader industry shift where AI coding assistants are migrating outside of traditional IDEs and into workplace collaboration tools where teams already work. We'll take a look at how one of Cursor's engineers does this to build their own internal apps later in the briefing, so stay tuned for that. With OpenAI reportedly planning to release a bunch of workplace tools of its own, including potentially even a rival of Slack, it makes strategic sense for Anthropic to double down on these type of Slack integrations. Slack's parent company, Salesforce, will be happy, and its stock is up 10% this week, which is in part driven by the fact that Agents Force's annual recurring revenue is now $540 million, which is up over 4x year-on-year. Year. A comparison of the company's slides from their latest financial results shows that they've added Agent Force to each of their product lines in an attempt to reinforce its AI credentials. Meanwhile, Instacart has become the first company to launch an embedded end-to-end -end shopping experience in ChatGPT using Instant Checkout. So this is built using the new Agentic Commerce protocol, and the integration will allow users to plan their meals and then buy the ingredients all in one single interface. Recipe planning is a major use case for ChatGPT, with research showing that it makes up almost 1% of all queries. This integration is a pretty helpful case study for product teams to analyse, particularly with regards to how it manages to balance the risk of disintermediation, where users ditch the end product, in this case Instacart, in favour of ChatGPT. To reduce this risk, the integration includes UI changes with buttons including Instacart's brand colours, and overall the experience looks pretty polished and well done. OpenAI's head of product, Nick Turley, who previously worked at Instacart, is reported to have put third-party integrations like this at the top of his product priorities as part of his vision of building a super assistant, and it'll be pretty interesting to see what other products follow Instacart's lead, and also whether users actually use it. These types of integrations could also play a role in further reducing the number of clicks that are reported from ChatGPT. New analysis recently published shows that when Google's AI overviews are shown to users, the number of click-through rates has dropped from over 1% down to just over 0.5%. And if you're interested in learning more about so-called generative engine optimization, in other words, how you can ensure your product appears in AI tools like ChatGPT, then check out this week's knowledge series over on Substack. In this knowledge series, I take a look at everything you need to know about so-called GEO, including some key terminology and concepts, steps you can take to rank higher in AI search tools, as well as a GEO product database, which contains over 25 different new products and tools you can use to measure and optimize your product's GEO performance. So if you're interested in this emerging new topic, then check out this new knowledge series over on the Substack. In other news this week, Google has unveiled a pretty impressive looking new AI agent feature called Artifacts, which is designed to help product teams manage and review the work of AI agents. In many ways, this feels a bit like a new way to do code reviews directly inside its new IDE anti-gravity. And this can include custom reports containing things like technical architecture diagrams and presentation decks to help explain what work the agent has completed. You can comment and provide feedback directly inside the artifact, and it looks like a pretty helpful feature for both developers and also less technical members of the team too. So if you're looking for new ways to review the work of AI agents, then artifacts could be worth checking out. And Google Labs have also upgraded two of their new AI power products that could be useful for product teams. First, they upgraded their experimental mood boarding tool called Mixboard. So this new feature lets users transform boards into structured Google Slides presentations, and Google's VP of Labs said that the new capability combines the text from your board and your input to build beautifully designed presentations. Mixboard is predominantly aimed at B2C use cases, but it could be potentially helpful for product designers who want to create brand presentations. And second, they have shipped a new feature called Prototypes into their ex other experimental product called Stitch. 
If you've not heard of this before, Stitch is a vibe coding design app that lets product teams build interfaces conversationally. And this new feature called Prototype will allow you to select multiple screens and then stitch them together to create a functional clickable user flow. And to be honest, with a name like Stitch, they probably should have shipped this in V1. In a recent poll, most of you said that you're using Figma as your main vibe coding app. And this week, Figma launched some new features of its own, including a series of new image editing features that let users erase and isolate objects, as well as expand the backgrounds of imagery. So if you're looking for new ways to edit some of the assets that you work with in your product's design, then take a look at these new features from Figma. Now let's move on to some data and trends from the week. And one major new piece of research this week is a new piece of research from Perplexity. So this research revealed how people are using AI agents inside its Comet browser. So this study was commissioned by both Perplexity and Harvard University, and it found that productivity, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the leading use case with 36% of users using Comet for this, followed by learning, media, and shopping. For product teams, analyzing agentic browsing habits is actually quite a helpful way to get a glimpse of what the future of browsing might look like. So as you can see in this graph, productivity is the main use case, followed by learning and research and media and entertainment. And then if we break down the types of productivity work in Comet, you can see that documents and form editing is the top use case, followed by account management and email management. Other trends from the report include the fact that Google Docs accounted for 12% of all queries, with LinkedIn at 9.4% and YouTube at 7%. The report also found that while users are happy to outsource research tasks for industries, like booking a flight for example, they still expect the agent to hand the browser back to the user to actually complete the purchase. So if you're interested in learning how users are actually using AI browsers like Comet, then check out that report from Perplexity and I'll put the link in the description for you as well. But Perplexity wasn't the only company to release a major piece of research this week. OpenAI also released their new State of Enterprise AI report, and they found that non-technical workers are increasingly using AI for coding. So for example, 75% of users report being able to complete new tasks. And there is a 36% average increase in coding-related messages outside of engineers. The report also found that coding has the largest relative gap between frontier and median workers. So a frontier worker is someone whose AI usage places them in the top 5% for intensity. And you can see from this graph that the difference between those two is more pronounced in coding than anything else. And Australia, Brazil, the Netherlands and France are the fastest growing regions for enterprise customers versus all other companies. So this report may have been strategically released as the company doubles down on its enterprise sales. But if you are interested in learning more about how people are using OpenAI's products in the context of enterprise, then take a look at that report. Elsewhere this week, a new piece of research found that the median annual recurring revenue for SaaS products has actually plummeted from highs of 36% growth in 2021 to just 15% in 2025. Now, there are probably many reasons for this, and one of them is probably the rise of vibe coding internal apps. And this week, one of Cursor's engineers explained how he approaches vibe coding internal tools at the company. He says it starts with an idea, which is usually a point of friction internally, and then he starts prompting in a Slack channel to get a draft pull request going. This is good for a couple of reasons, he says, because it makes his intent transparent to the team and then anyone else can chime in if they have any opinions. Once he's ready, he'll then dig the PR from Slack without ever having to open up the editor. So again, it looks like Slack is cementing itself at the center of AI-led development and internal tools are no different. But while SaaS companies may be struggling to grow, one type of product that is growing is mobile apps. New analysis revealed this week shows that mobile apps are on the rise downloads of mobile apps have increased for the first time in eight years, which are up 24% on the year. And vibe coding could also potentially be playing a role in driving this growth. Plus, I do wonder if behavioral UX shifts towards conversational interfaces may also be driving more adoption of mobile apps. And of course, there's the recent App Store legal changes that make it easier to link to external providers for payments in the process bypassing Apple's fees. And speaking of mobile apps, we'll finish this week with the official winner of Apple's iPhone app of the year. This is called Timo, and it's designed to boost productivity for people with ADHD or users who prefer visual organizations. So if you're looking for a calmer way to stay productive for the rest of 2025 and heading into 2026, then check that one out. And on that note, I'll leave it there for this week. Thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.